Welcome to our Emerald City Kitchen. I'm Bill Campbell. And I'm Erwin Terry. And we're here to talk about the cookbooks of Oz. You'll notice that we're decked out in our Emerald City finery with our hats, our glasses, and we're ready to cook in our aprons. Oz cookbooks are actually something that I've never given a whole lot of thought to, but we were asked to do this by Jane Albright as a bit of a last minute presentation. So we are doing our best. <laughs> I looked through my bookshelves and actually I discovered that I do have several Oz cookbooks and Jane sent a few along as well. So we'll be looking at several different kinds of things. But to start with, I think the first or about the oldest Oz cookbook that I know of anyway would be the series of Jell-O booklets that were done in, I think it was 1932, which they were the, for the Little Wizard stories were presented in book form, but at the back, you will see, well, there we go, that there is a little set of Jell-O recipes. Now, the recipes, I think they might vary from one book to another. In this one, you have things like magic ice and the emerald fruit cup. Mm, the others don't really have anything Aussie sounding to them. Which brings up one of the first points that I've noticed in Oz cookbooks, which is basically the food has very little to do with Oz. It's all a matter of coming up with a clever name to put on a dish that could be called anything well, else you color. like. Well, and color. Color yes. makes difference. Well, and that's one of the interesting things about the cookbooks is the way that the different authors have kind of broached that basic problem. <laughs> so, but the Jell-O book, like I say, is about the earliest one that I'm aware There's of. Jell-O on the back? Yes, the Scarecrow and the Tin Man in Jell-O mold. And another one from that same time period, actually several, booklets that were done, and these technically are not Oz cookbooks, but they were written by Ruth Plumley Thompson, who wrote Oz books. You can see the poster over there. Yes. True for the book. Actually, I'm not sure if you can the way the camera is set, but... Uh, <laughs> you will. You'll, you'll catch it in the background. But in the case of these, we have, again, a little story that Ruth Plumley Thompson wrote, and on each page there's also a recipe, which is basically promoting royal baking powder. So the recipes in these booklets make a lot of use of baking powder. We're going to use baking powder today. True. And it might be royal, I don't know. No, it's not. Um, oh, well. Anyway, <laughs> some of the recipes are a little bit odd, to my mind at least, because things like donuts that are made with baking powder, as opposed to what I think of as a donut being a raised donut, but that's just me. So another Aussie cookbook, not really an Oz cookbook, but it's related. So, from there, the next one, that this is one that Jane sent that I have never seen in my life, the Kitchen Wizard Cookbook. And this is an odd little booklet from 1970, when is it from? 1977. And basically, it, it takes a couple of different stories, one of them being Oz. And so you have things like a Munchkin Brunch, which has... Crunchy Brunchy, hmm. Flying Monkey Muffins, which are muffins with a strip of bacon that... That just means of, you throw them across the room at uh, each other. Yes, they, I mean... Any really, muffin can be a Flying Monkey Muffin if you throw it. They really don't look anything like monkeys, but they kind of look like, I don't know what they look like, like a rabbit. Anyway, it's a Flying Monkey Muffin. <laughs> and um, Blackberry Witches, so, which is basically Blackberry Pancakes. And... <laughs> Otherwise, the book also goes into a couple of other, I think there's a little bit of Huck Finn and just an odd conglomeration of things. But it does have a little bit of an Oz touch to it. So it's an Ozzy cookbook. The first book that I really think of as being an Oz cookbook is this one by Monica Bailey, which comes from 80, 1982, I think. 81, 1981. And this one, this is the first one where there's a real effort made to take recipes and relate them to the Wizard of Oz, in that the different areas of the country, have the different regions have been given different kinds of recipes. For example, the Quadlings in the South get more Southern style food. Uh, the different colors of the countries are reflected in things like in the Munchkin country, you have blueberry dishes. Um, Stuffed green peppers, royal yes. green beans for the, for the Emerald, Emerald City. City. Soldier with the green whiskers salad. salad. Again, so, the recipes themselves are pretty straightforward. But straightforward recipes with Emerald but City. But they do names. have a name. 
<laughs> and it was a very nicely done book too. If you take a look at it here, it has it uses Denslow's artwork and has color plates. And all in all, a very attractive little little cookbook, which mine unfortunately is starting to fall apart a little bit. But that's the first one that I really know of. Now from there we move into a couple of others that I am less familiar with. For example, The Wizard of Oz Cookbook. And this one is clearly going to be movie related with the movie characters. And it's Breakfast in Kansas, Dessert in Oz. So when you take a look at it, you have, well, the contents. You have Breakfast in Kansas, a kid's party in Munchkin Land, appetizers on the Yellow Brick Road, cocktails at the Witch's Castle, and dessert in the Emerald City. So, sounds like a busy day. But, you again... You have to walk off all that food. I suppose. Um, you have things like Wicked Witch Waffles, Lollipop Field Lollipops, Parmesan Poppy Wafers, which all sound good, actually. Um, but, again, you know, fairly straightforward. This one does have a little segment that has a little bits of information about the movie. It has, you know, quotes from the movie, some photographs mixed in, little tidbits of interesting stuff, some dialogue. So, it's a fun mix of things. And handy little size, too. And the next one that we're going to do here, Cooking in Oz, which, again, is actually along that same line, although this now... In Cooking in Oz, you get a lot more information about the movie, about various people. There are recipes that are actually from some of the actors in the movie. For example, I don't know where it is now, but there's something like Billy Burke's... I forget what it was. Well, you've got Margaret's Down Home Chicken and Dumplings, which was from Margaret Pellegrini. Uh, Little Oscar's Pineapple Ham Burger, which was Meinhart Rob, who played... The coroner and a variety of different kinds of recipes and pictures and information so just an enjoyable book to take a look at and here actually you even have a section that shows Cora's coconut cookie bars and that leads us right into our next cookbook which is the Cora's country cookbook which is pictured right here yes this has nothing to do with us but it is Margaret Hamilton so, I suppose it does have as much to do with Oz as most of the other Oz cookbooks. And this is essentially... And well, Cora was her Maxwell House coffee. Yes, I was She her, was the Maxwell House coffee lady, that so... Was her persona, <laughs> that was... with her commercials for the coffee. Um, and this one, again, is... This is pretty much just straightforward recipes. There's not really any Oz relation to it, but it's, you know, you've got Margaret on the cover. And she's holding a pie. I mean... We wouldn't want to be greeted by a witch with a pie. And <laughs> going on to the next one, we have the Everything Oz book. This one is interesting because it's not really a cookbook as such. It's a craft and party favor, and it's a whole variety of things. But there are recipes it's, mixed. It's almost, a life, it's almost a Martha Stewart-style lifestyle book. Yeah, I mean, it has I mean, little glasses, you can, you can, uh, you can decorations. Make, you can do uh, glasses. You can... Little head pieces. Um, hair pieces. There's this is what I liked. A decorated dog. The, the decorated dog house for your little Toto. And somewhere in a corner you'll probably see Maisie. Yeah, she floats around. She she kinda comes and goes and hides out in the corners while we're doing these kinds of things in the kitchen. And keeps an eye on what's going on. So But she could have a decorated dog house. Yes. But that has a variety of things and actually there's one thing which we're going to be Taking a look at something that we did get inspired by this book, which is Glow in the Dark Emerald City Jello. So, so we're going to try that. We'll see. But, as I say, we'll see. <laughs> and the last one that I have, again from Jane, is A Taste of Wicked, which this is an interesting cookbook. It, I don't really know much about where this came from, which I forgot to ask Jane. I was going to do that before we did this, and I didn't. But it's obviously been put together by the cast members of Wicked. And so it's a variety of recipes by different people. It seems to have been done, I mean, timing-wise, I can tell it was done during the period where Adina Menzel is still playing Elphaba and... Uh, Kristen Chenoweth has already Kristen left. Kristen Chenoweth has left the show. Laura Thompson. There's recipes from her. Yes. But Linda not Kristen. Glenda. 
So, but Alpha's Buzz recipe is actually, no, actually I take that back. Alpha Buzz has more than one. No, that's a different, that's an understudy. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm kind of dithering here, but I'm getting drawn into the cookbook. What I remember is Adina Menzel's recipe, which was basically Alpha Bagels, which consisted of getting out of bed and calling the bagel shop and ordering bagels. So I don't think Adina Menzel cooks. <laughs> But Jennifer Laura Thompson, on the other hand, had a pink goes with green cake, which was a green cake with pink frosting. So she must do some cooking. But it's a fun little booklet. I, have, I don't know how it was available or where it was available from, actually. But they are probably out there and can probably be tracked down. So now we're going to remove our hats. Yes. And which, we're going to start cooking. And Irma's going to demonstrate a recipe we have put together for the purpose, which, like all the other Oz recipes, it's essentially a name, which we're making yellow brick scones, which are something that would be a handy treat walking down the yellow brick road. They fit in the basket. You could, you could give one to Toto. It would keep you going for a while. But yeah. Anyway, that's what we've come up with to make for our demonstration portion. So we'll get on to that. Fine. This is how we make our yellow brick scones. You start with your dry ingredients. So you need two cups of flour, and flour is always best if you scoop, because it aerates the flour, scoop into your measuring cup, and that goes in the bowl, and level it off. It's two tablespoons, actually it's gonna get three tablespoons of Parmesan cheese, these are going to be very cheesy scones. To bring up the color, we're going to add a half a, actually we're going to add a whole teaspoon of turmeric. Half a teaspoon of cayenne pepper. Now I like them spicy. If you don't want them as spicy, you, can don't, you don't even have to add the cayenne pepper. It needs two tablespoons of baking powder to help it all rise. A quick correction, use two teaspoons of baking powder. I said two tablespoons, but I used two teaspoons. And a little bit of salt. I usually just throw in a pinch of salt, but the recipe calls for a quarter teaspoon, so we'll measure a quarter teaspoon. I don't like things to get too salty, but there's a quarter teaspoon. You mix all that together. And then we're going to cut the butter in. Now we've got a third of a cup of butter. And the butter's cold. We take a knife and we're going to break this up into pieces to make it easier to cut it in. You can do this in a food processor, but then you have to clean the food processor. So I like doing it by hand. And there's two methods of doing it by hand, depending on how you like to do things or want to experiment with doing things. So you mix that in. You can use a pastry cutter. And basically, you're just trying to make the butter as small as possible. The other method, and you have to keep cleaning the pastry cutter, is to actually do it by hand. And to do that, you put, get your hands in, you, you pick up the butter, and you just squeeze the flour into it. And you can actually do this, once you get over the fear of cutting the butter in by hand, you can do it very easily. And the flour keeps the butter from melting. And you're trying to create little tiny pieces of butter. They always say pea size shaped. And so this takes a couple minutes. And you're just, all you're doing is rubbing. You just rub the butter with the flour and it gets smaller and smaller. The butter is going to give the scones some lift and some flavor and puff. You can keep doing that 
you can. My mother always did it with a pastry cutter. We didn't have a food processor when I was a kid, so. And that's just pounding down. But that looks good. Now you have to add the wet ingredients. And the wet ingredients, actually we're going to add the cheese next. The cheese goes in. It's a cup and a half of grated cheddar. And you mix that in with the flour so that everything's coated. The wet ingredients are two eggs. and a third of a cup of milk and we're going to beat that with a fork and get the eggs incorporated with the milk you make a little well in the center you pour that in and with a spoon you can get things going you're going to end up finishing this off with your hands. You can do this all by hand, or you can start with a spoon, and you're wetting everything up. But you're going to have to get your hands in it eventually. So that's a good mix. So now we're going to clear things away and get ready to shape our scones. So the next step is to actually shape our scones. We've got the dough which is a really nice dough. And it's holding together nicely. In the bowl. Put some flour down. And now you get to get your hands in it. I told you you were going to get your hands in it at some point. And flour you. Flour the palms of your hands. You can get a little more flour over here. And you're going to pat this out. So that's about a half an inch thick. These are going to be nice, nicely sized scones. Because we're making yellow brick scones, we have brick shaped cookie cutters. You can also cut this with a knife if you want to. Um, if you don't want to go to the trouble of getting brick shaped cookie cutters. Each cookie cutter, you flour it a little bit, cut all the way down, and start laying them out. That's a few of the small ones. Now let's try the big cutter. The cutters are two inches. This is a two inch cutter and this is a three inch cutter. So the three inch cutter is going to give us some larger bricks and you want to flour your board because if you don't flour it, they start to stick to your board a little bit, which there's not as much flour over here. So this is sticking down a little more, but doesn't mean you can't get it off. Cut as many as you can get. various sizes. You want some of both sides. And then we're going to take the scraps, pull them all together, move some flour over again. Pat the dough out so you're half inch thick and keep cutting. I'm trying to keep a fairly even number, although I'm not too worried about it. Of you keep re shaping and recutting. I can get one more. And then you're going to end up with some extra. And the extra I always make whenever I make scones, you always end up with this little bit of extra. 
I always make that into a little ball, and that's the one I get to try when it comes out of the oven to make sure it tastes, everything tastes okay. So now we're giving them all some space. They are going to grow. You've got the butter and the baking powder in there, so they're going to puff up and grow. And the next step, the finishing step before we bake, is we're going to put an egg wash. So it's one egg and a little bit of water. Just a little bit of water. Beat it up once again. And I have to go grab my brush. My brush to So we've got our egg wash. I'm brushing the top of each one with egg wash. Not only does it help it brown, but it's going to help them. We're going to add more cheese on top. These are very cheesy scones. And they're going to have lots of flavor. And we're going to put more cheese on top. So there's cheese in them and cheese on top of them. And the egg wash will help the cheese stick. So I just want to make sure I hit each one. We'll turn that one so these two sideways. And now we're going to add some cheese. First we're going to put some more Parmesan cheese and just sprinkle the, the top of each scone with some Parmesan. If you cover your baking sheet with a piece of parchment like I have or a Silpat, you'll have much easier cleanup. You can do it just right on the pan, but the pan itself is going to have excess cheese and this way you don't have to be too worried about where the cheese goes when you're putting it on. You can overspill a little bit. Then we're going to add some more of the sharp cheddar. The sharp cheddar is great. You can use regular cheddar or sharp cheddar, but why not get more flavor with the sharp? So each one you just mound up a little more sharp cheddar. This recipe uses two, uh, a two cup packet of um, shredded cheese. So you put a cup and a half into the scones themselves and then you have this extra half cup to decorate the top with. And that's handy that you only have to buy one packet of cheese for it. And that is perfect. Now it's going to go into the oven. And the oven is set at 400 degrees. And it's going to go in for 15 to 17 minutes. At about the 10 minute mark you want to spin it to make sure that they're baking evenly. But you'll see when they come out of the oven they're going to be puffed and golden and they're really going to be good. Well, it's been 15 minutes and the scones are done. They smell great. And as you can see, they brown nicely. And like I was telling you, with the parchment, we've caught all that extra cheese so it's not burned onto our baking sheet. And they actually do, if they don't stick to each other too badly, they come off the parchment very nicely. Whereas if this was just on the baking sheet, they would probably be stuck to your baking sheet. So you want to use Silpat or parchment, which is really easy to find these days. They smell great. Okay, so now that we have our yellow brick scones made up, we thought we needed something to drink with them. And there's a lot of things, a lot of varieties out there of different rainbow punches, but this is a simple thing that we decided we would try, uh, which we're calling it a polychrome punch, since I'm more of a book person. And basically you take freezer pops, so available in anybody's, any supermarket freezer, in different colors, and cut them up. And you can do this actually with the freezy pops and the plastic that you slide out. We just didn't couldn't find any of those, so we bought popsicles. Same kind of thing. But when you hit the stick, you just cut, cut, cut on either side, and then go straight down. Start with blue. So take our different colors here. And of course, since you want it to be rainbow-like, you want to arrange them in rainbow order. 
It's um, probably up in the blue. And this is something that certainly is very kid friendly. Um, might be a little, also just fun. Yeah, it's fun. It's a bit on the sweet side, but. <laughs> Yellow pop. Nice thing is you can get the pops in these colors in a box in the freezer section of the store. So it's easy to find, easy to easy to do. Finally red. The vibrant one. here and the fine last step is just take a little bit of a sparkling soda yeah. seven up a spray a lemon lime of some sort even ginger ale would work ginger ale would work too we're gonna it will watch foam out up. for foaming and there you have a polychrome punch or, if you want to, add some vodka and you can have potted polychrome. Now, I mentioned earlier that we were going to try a recipe out of one of the cookbooks, and it was the Glow in the Dark Emerald City Jello. So, we'll see if it works. We'll see. Here we have our mold with the jello ready to come out. So, I'm going to cut around the bottom edge to help with removal. And then, I'm going to step out of frame here. We have a big pot of hot water in the sink, and Bill's going to immerse the jello mold in the hot water for just about 30 seconds. Or a little longer if necessary. And then we're going to see, it, see how it unmolds. But it should be our nice Emerald City green. So here he's back with it. It should be done. That's the noise we wanted. There we go. <laughs> Here we are, and we have our Emerald City Jello, and our Polychrome Punch, and our Yellow Brick Scones. And it might be a mistake to call any baked good something brick, but they actually are very light and very tasty. So we can. They're currently in a brick pile. True. But with a little bit of arranging. You can make yourself your own yellow brick road. And you'll see when you break one open, they are actually very yellow because of the turmeric that we put into the batter. So, yellow brick road to the Emerald City. And one final thing to try the Emerald City is supposed to glow because there is quinine in the mix. When you make your jello, you simply you add, add tonic, water tonic water instead of water. So let's see. I'm not sure if this is going to work, but we will try and see if we can get it to light up. Will the Emerald City actually glow? And we've got our black lights on it. We're going to turn off the overhead. And well, it does. It goes more opaque. It and goes glows. more opaque. Now the yellow brick silver. road is really glowing. So mm -hmm. the scones are glowing like mad. Very yellow. And yeah, I would call that a qualified success. The jello actually looks opaque more than glowing, but there it is. The overall effect is kind of fun. So, a little bit of punch and a click. Cheers.